we've got some music today. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Good morning, church. It's so much fun to get together and worship, and the beautiful sun is out. Um, we're going to sing an oldie but goodie. Wonderful, merciful Savior. Join us. <laughs> if you want to stand up, you can. Bring the energy. Wonderful, merciful Savior. We all know this. church family. Happy Sabbath. What a beautiful Sabbath it is. We finally have some sun, which is so great. I feel like it's been raining every Sabbath. Um, but sadly, next week we close our doors. Um, this is the last time that we'll be worshiping in this sanctuary together for the month of April. So um, we just wanted to let you know church will not be open next week, and I'll have Dr. Bob come up here to tell us more about that right now. Good morning, church. Uh, can we start with our uh, projection up there? Uh, as you know, there will be no church here next week or Sabbath school. So um, registration, by the way, is closed as of yesterday. Are there any procrastinators that would like to raise their hands? Okay, uh, let me tell you that if you did not register uh, in talking with the camp, if you come to the camp that morning, you will have to go into the uh, registration building there and register then. And you probably will be able to come for the whole day. As to whether you're going to be able to eat for the whole day, I cannot guarantee you. But um, I will probably bring a botch box lunch that you can enjoy. Anyway, 
try to come and be with us. Uh, Janelle Beats or Damaris Matthews will be people that you may want to talk to this week. No service here. Now, uh, when you go out today in the church lobby, there are papers that give you directions to Hume Christian Camp, SoCal Camp. Uh, you could also go to your search uh, map in the car. It's near Running Springs. There is also a map of the campgrounds so you can acquaint yourself with it. And there are some registration forms still available, but you'd have to bring that registration form with you that Sabbath and go to the registration booth and go through the time to go through the process. Now, the thing that I want to emphasize is, since we're not staying at Pine Springs Ranch, <laughs> we begin at 7 o'clock, so you can't just roll out of bed at 6.30, okay? It'll take you about 45 plus minutes to get from here to the camp. So uh, we are having a time of prayer together with the head elders and Pastor Darren at 7.30. But our first meeting for adults begins at 8 a.m. in the uh, Oak Chapel there. And Carl Hafter will be speaking and starting our theme on Better Together. Then all Sabbath schools will begin at approximately 9.15 a.m. We have programs for all ages for the whole day. Children's ministries will be in the cafeteria area, youth in the snack shack or the snack shop, and the adults in the Oak Chapel. Then church service is for families and adults in the Oak Chapel at 11.15, and the speaker then is Pastor Iki or Ike from uh, La Sierra Church, and the youth will be with uh, uh, Tim Oliver, who is the chaplain of Loma Linda Academy. Lunch will be at one o'clock for those who have registered. And remember, your registration fee includes both lunch and supper, which are vegetarian slash vegan uh, for your preference. Um, Camp Supper is at 5.30 all afternoon. You will have programs for all ages, plus ability to go up to Green Lake if you want to and so on, and just sleep or nap or pray or fellowship, whatever you want. Supper is at 5.30. Vespers for everybody at 7 o'clock by various uh, ages. And then Saturday night at Hume at 8 o'clock, which will include Pete McLeod, Christian magician, and some other great talent. 9.15, ice cream, and 10 o'clock on your way home. So a great day for everybody at uh, Hume Christian Camp. It's a beautiful camp uh, overlooking uh, the valley there. And we hope uh, you'll enjoy some of these pictures here, our speakers, youth speaker, programs for all ages. Uh, the musician, by the way, over here, Chris Ryder, is a jazz trumpeter who's played for Newsboys, uh, for uh, Michael W. Smith, um, et cetera, et cetera, and is a tremendous trumpet player. And that Glenn Phillips does a pretty good job. And um, he will be leading out in the praise team. And uh, then this quartet uh, known as Grace Force Quartet that are traveling all over the country right now and will be singing for us. They sang for us, I believe, at camp meeting. Any other slides do we have? So, Sabbath retreat, we hope to see you there. One thing I'd ask you to do during this week is to pray that that whole campground will be covered with the Holy Spirit, that God will be there and we will fellowship together with him. You all come. All right. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Thank you so much. Thank you for all the work that you've put into this program for us. All right. Today, we do have fellowship lunch, so we hope if you're a visitor, you will join us. If you're not a visitor, you can still join us. Um, we uh, just really want to encourage you to um, come to that if you would like to. Um, 
we also, after potluck today, have um, our community service um, preparation. Uh, they will be going through the book, uh, When Helping Hurts. It's a really great book. And, um, and they'll be going through that after the potluck. So um, it's not too late if you'd like to join that. It's really good to kind of prime yourself for going out and doing outreach in a way that's effective and doesn't actually end up hurting people. So we hope that you will join for that. Um, again, not too late, you can still join. That is going to be in the green room. I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, all right. Um, we have some ordinations coming up, and seeing as I'm one of them, I'm going to speak about these people in the third person because it's awkward to self-promote. So on May 11, Pastor Danielle is going to be ordained here. at 4 p.m., and so we invite you all to join and, uh, and uh, worship with us that day. Also, May 18, our Pastor Mark is going to be ordained during our worship. Yes, you can still clap. He's still part of us. <laughs> We're very excited. We're very excited to, um, to come around him and pray over him and, um, and encourage him as he continues his ministry. So that's going to be on May 18, and that one's going to be during the worship service, okay? So we hope you all will come out for Pastor Mark's last, servi last um, worship service with us and his ordination. And uh, finally, I just wanted to let you know we are beginning a new sermon series today um, called Position for Purpose. Pastor Darren's going to be preaching. We know it'll be good. Um, pray over him uh, as he prepares to do that in this sermon series is on the life of Joseph. So we hope you enjoy that and are blessed. Now is the time in our worship service that we greet one another. So we hope that you will take the time especially to go and greet someone maybe you haven't seen before. Have a blessed Sabbath. children are going to go around and collect an offering. So take out those um, 20s, 10s, 5s, 1s, 100s, whatever you have in your wallet. Take it out and the kids will go and collect that. And this offering goes to support Christian education at Mesa Grande Academy. So we thank you for your generosity. All right, kids, go get the offering and then come up for a children's story.
Good morning, boys and girls. I am going to tell you how a story saved my life. It really, really did. When my sister and I were kids, we would walk all over town. We had the freedom to do that. My sister was about 11. Is anyone here about that age? 10, 11, 12, there you go. I was probably about eight. Is anyone here seven or eight or nine? Well, there's quite a few of you. Well, one of our favorite things to do was to walk about a mile from our house and go to a grocery store that sold candy. Does anybody like candy? Oh, it was a good thing I had to walk a mile to get candy because I ate a lot of it. <laughs> On the way home, we were laughing and talking, and I had this yummy candy in my mouth. Now, it was one of those round ones, kind of flat round, but a, a, a little humpy on the top and bottom. Do you know what those are? They're hard candies. What? Maybe. It wasn't a chocolate coin. It was a butterscotch candy. And I loved these. And it was in my mouth. But then something happened. It was like a lollipop without the stick. Okay, so it was the sugary, yummy part. Don't want to eat the stick. So that thing just suddenly slipped into the back of my throat. And instead of swallowing it like a big, huge pill, it just got stuck. And I couldn't breathe. I let my sister know I couldn't breathe. She figured out it out right away because she's very smart. And she looked around for help. She looked way over there and there and there. And there was nobody to help. Well. She looked across the street, way across the street, where she knew there was a medical building. How she knew that, I don't know, but she knew. And she thought, can I make it over to there? It was not chocolate. It was hard sugar, <laughs> hard, solid sugar. Yeah, I'll tell you about the candy. That's part's coming. So. <laughs> So my sister, what did I do with it? At the store with money. So my sister knew she couldn't run to that medical building and get help and come back to me. And she thought, what can I do? What can I do? And then she remembered years and years and years and years ago, our grandma had told us a story about how she had been near a baby that was choking, and she had turned that baby upside down gently. Don't try this at home. <laughs> and she had patted it on the back, and the baby wasn't choking anymore. Whatever it was choking on came, up, came out. So my sister looked at me and thought, she's too big. I can't really do that. But she said to me, Really fast, Jeannie, do a handstand. Do any of you know what a handstand is? You do. do you, you can do that? I'm not going to ask you to do that right now. But you can too? Well, I love doing handstands. It's not like you don't put your hand down here and stand on it. That is not a handstand. Can you tell me what a handstand is? Right, and your feet are up in the air. So I did that, because I love doing that. And my sister started to grab me by my ankles, but there's not a lot of difference in height. And, you know, I'm heavier than a baby. You know, when you're eight, you're heavier. And she thought, oh no, I can't take her by her ankles and shake her up and down. That's not gonna work. So she got down and she grabbed me around my middle and lifted me up. And you know, that butterscotch candy was launched. It went flying, and I could breathe again. 
And I am so thankful my grandma told us that story of how she had saved that baby. Because otherwise, I wouldn't be telling the story, would I? It's hard to live without air. So, you can't live without air. No, you can live without candy, but not, not without air. So, stories teach us a lot. There's lots of wisdoms in the stories, wisdom in the stories we hear from our pastors and our Sabbath school teachers and our teachers and our friends and our grandmas and, you know, just a lot of people. So, like, soak up the stories. That's all I can say. Okay, you can go back to your seats. I love seeing all the kids. They're so awesome. <laughs> so precious. Now we're going to call for offering and it's for church budget there's so many beautiful ministries here at this church all the kids ministries and vbs and all of the um just outreach things that becky's been leading us in so many beautiful things that this church is up to i've been blessed with and my kids have been blessed with so i just want to invite the deacons forward and we're going to pray over the offering um, for church budget. God, I just praise you for this church. Um, I praise you for all the loving, generous, beautiful lights, um, full of like kindness and warmth. Um, so many servants of you. Thank you for this church and the blessing it's been to so many way that you share your love through um, their generosity. I bless, I just ask for your blessing on this church, on this service, and on this offering. In your name, amen. All right, church, we did this a couple weeks ago together. I got to have you put your hands together, okay? Ready, right here. Okay, then sing with me. This is my story. I'll testify that God is good all the time. He saw me and heard my cry. Now I am this. Sing out again. This is my story. I'll testify that God is good all the time. He saw me and heard my cry.
it again. my life 
God, you're so worthy of our praise. You're so worthy of the beauty that you create. You're so worthy of our worship. I just invite us to take our minds off of everything that's been weighing on us, that we've been worried about, that's been floating around in our, our minds, and just focus our eyes on how good, how good is, is our God. Our God is so good. Sing with us. Goodness of God.
uh, have prayer at this time, we're going to uh, have our congregational prayer from Chris Church. And right before that, we're going to combine this uh, together. We want to invite Steve Dunbar to come up because he's having surgery on Monday morning. We want to have a special prayer for you as well. So, Steve, if you could come up and anybody else that would also like to come up in the garden of prayer or also to be able to put your hands around Steve as we pray for him. And once uh, I say a prayer for Steve, then Chris will close out uh, for the congregational prayer. Uh, Mark, can you just play a little bit as people come forward and um, everyone who stays in your seats, if you are able, we'd invite you to kneel with us as we pray. healing Steve of this cancer we thank you so much for the medical team the incredible team that he has that he's been meeting with um, we thank you that he is in their hands we pray that you would um, give them alertness focus precision um, wisdom as they do the surgery on Monday Lord most of all may your Holy Spirit guide them as they do it Lord, I'm so thankful for this church family that uniquely we have some, quite a few people that know exactly what Steve is facing. And I thank you for the ways in which they have been there for him and been a comfort for him. I pray that we can continue to be a support for him as he recovers from the surgery. I wanna pray for Sabina as well, Lord, that you would give her courage and strength as she journeys through this alongside Steve. And Lord, what we are most thankful for is that Steve is not journeying through this alone without you, that your presence is there with him every step of the way. We just want to also claim this same promise from Isaiah that was spoken to the Israelites long ago for Steve this morning. So do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. for your kindness that draws us to you. Uh, you, are, you are good. And, yes. and the most amazing thing is that you've called us friends. And so uh, we come to you this morning. We've allowed ourselves to become weary and heavy laden. And we just seek your rest. And uh, want to bask in your humility and gentleness. And uh, like children with broken toys and, and scraped knees, we come to you and hold up our request this morning. And we've already brought uh, our brother Steve to you. Um, Lord, thank you so much uh, for what you're going to do in his life and what you've done so far. Uh, there are many others. Um, we think of the, uh, the quilts out in the lobby uh, for, for Ian Schmidt. We pray that you would give him relief of his suffering and healing. For Debbie Krignan as she uh, battles leukemia, her and those that support her, Rick Hill um, and Cizo family, and so many more that you know about. Um, you are the healer, and uh, however you bring healing, uh, we, we look forward to seeing what you're going to do. 
Lord, I pray you'd be with Darren as he brings your word this morning. Soften our hearts to hear what you have to say to us. And in the end, Lord, we don't understand much, but we understand that you are good and that you love us. Amen. came across uh, an article this week in the Wall Street Journal. It wasn't written this week, but I came across it this week. The title of the article is called The Dysfunctional Family House. It begins like this. The Ledbetter family likes to spend time at home together, just not always in the same room. So they built a 3,600 square foot house with all kinds of special rooms for work, for different hobbies, separate sitting areas for each child, and a master bedroom far from all the other rooms. There's even an escape room, Mr. Ledbetter said in the article as he was being interviewed. Any family member can go there to get away from the rest of us. Mr. Ledbetter goes on to say, the house has helped my seven and 11-year-old daughters fight a lot less because they now have so many ways to avoid each other. The article then goes on to say that after decades of pushing open floor plans where domestic life revolved around a big central open space and exposed kitchens, that the trend is starting to come back for some major builders and architects to design homes where people are walled off from each other. They're designing one person internet alcoves, locked away, uh, sorry, locked door away rooms and his or her offices on opposite ends of the house. Then they have this quote that's towards the end of the article from the director of research for the National Association of Home Builders who says, these new floor plans offer so much seclusion, they are perfect for the dysfunctional family. It's kind of a sad article to read. I mean, we all know that, you know, family members can use their space once in a while, right? We all need some space from each other. But this seems extreme. And of course, we also know that there are serious, severe cases of family dysfunction that do require leaving that family environment for the sake of someone's health or safety. But I gotta imagine that there's more help we can find for dealing with family dysfunction than just walling ourselves off from each other. And I think our passage today reveals such a help. Today, as Pastor Danielle says, we begin a new series on the life of Joseph. Joseph is, his story is in the book of Genesis. We're going to pick it up in the 37th chapter. And if there was ever a family in the Bible that maybe could have used a, a few more uh, closed off rooms, or a floor plan in their uh, dwelling place, it was probably Joseph's family. As we open to Genesis 37, we don't have to read very far to already see that Joseph's family is not the healthiest. So if you have your Bibles, in whatever format you have them today, open to Genesis 37, starting in verse 1. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bila, um, of Bila and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. 
Now Israel, that's also the name for Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, he, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Let's just stop with those four verses and already point out some of the dysfunctional details that we see there. The first, right off the bat, Joseph is out there tending flocks with his brothers, and he gives a bad report about them. Now, maybe they were doing some bad stuff. Maybe they were up to no good, and Joseph is just being honest and trying to honor his father and be responsible and gives an honest report. Or maybe there's some entitlement in Joseph here. Maybe he was being a spoiled little tattletale. It's hard to know. Then, for sure, we see a dysfunctional detail where we keep reading, and it says that Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, and the older brothers knew it. And it's not just because Joseph was born to Jacob in his old age, but because he is the son of his wife, Rachel, the woman he loved and wanted to marry, but his future father-in-law, in case you need a refresher on the story or, or don't know it, his future father-in-law, back when he was courting Rachel, uh, tricked him into marrying Rachel's older sister, Leah, instead. So Jacob had to wait and work longer for his father-in-law in order to then also marry Rachel. When he finally marries Rachel, she couldn't have any children at first, but Leah is able to have children. Yet Jacob gives all his love to Rachel and not Leah. You can see how this is a wonderful family dynamic that they have going on. Jealous of her sister's fertility, Rachel gave Jacob, her servant, Bela, to have a child with. Leah becomes jealous when that happens, and she's also, the Bible says, stopped having children at that moment. So she gives Jacob, her servant, Zilpah, to have a child with. These are not the details that we learn about in Sabbath school, in children's division, right, when we study Joseph and Jacob's story. But this is the family background of Joseph, showing that they were dealing with dysfunction long before he arrived. And then Rachel does finally have a son. It's Joseph. And Joseph's name means, may the Lord add another son. And later, she does have another son, Joseph's younger brother, Benjamin. But tragically, Rachel dies during childbirth. So even if it is so unhealthy and a, a bad thing that this father, Jacob, is doing, you can understand maybe why he loves Joseph more than his other sons because of that background. And then, to add insult to injury, Jacob gets a very special coat for Joseph to wear to remind everyone that he is the favorite constantly. The NIV describes the coat as ornate, which is probably the best description that we could give it. I know that traditionally we've said it's a coat of many colors. Even our sermon graphic, I tried to have many colors up there, but... Um, most scholars say that that word in the Hebrew that describes the coat is really obscure. It's really only this one time we see it in Genesis and then one other place in the Old Testament. They don't really know what it means, to be honest, but it's special or innate in some kind. Most commentators favor something more along the line that it was a full-length or long-sleeved coat. Either one of those would have signified that Joseph is walking around with a different status than that of his brother's. It'd be like if your brother walked around in a three-piece suit all day at home, like that's what your parents dressed him in and you were in, I don't know, pajamas or something like that, <laughs> work clothes of some kind. If he had this kind of coat, it would have meant that laboring in the fields would have been almost impossible. So the coat indicates that Joseph is management material. He doesn't get his hands dirty like his brother's. I think I too may have had a little bit of hatred for my father at least, or that my brother gets this special treatment. And the text says they could not speak a single kind word to Joseph. And it probably didn't help that Joseph also was a dreamer, and he has a few dreams. Some of you know the details well, and he shares those dreams with his family. Let's read that part of the story starting in verse five. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. 
he said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while all your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were, bow down, were bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father even rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. I've always wondered about this story. I know God has a plan for Joseph's life and, and maybe he's showing it to him in this, in this moment here, but, but I always have wondered, was Joseph in the right telling everybody in the family that he had these dreams? <laughs> dreams in the ancient world were considered to be derived from the divine realm and were taken seriously, so maybe Joseph is just trying to be faithful. He's trying to be honest with his family, sharing a message that he believes is from God. Or maybe it could be that there's still some arrogance or entitlement in Joseph's actions here. Why would he tell the whole family? Why not just maybe go to his father at first? It's hard to know Joseph's motives in this story. People have lots of opinions about that, but we really don't know. But whatever his motive is, these dreams didn't go over very well, right? Right. And because of that, here's the rest of what happens in the story. It's you know, a few verses to read through. I thought about just summarizing it, but this story reads so well, I thought I'd just read the rest of the chapter to you. Verse 12, please follow along. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. They have history in that place, by the way. Go back and read, if you want to hear even more dysfunction, read from Genesis 30 up into Genesis 37, and you'll see what happens in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived in Shechem, uh, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? Oh, they have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached him, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him, at, and throw him into one of the cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, Reuben is the oldest, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back in secret later to his father. At least Reuben, the eldest brother, has some sense or some form of compassion in this moment. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe that he was wearing. And they took him, they threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Probably it was a pretty bad fall to go down there. And they took him, or sorry, and then they sat down to eat their meal, which is also a crazy detail. How in the world could they sit down and eat together after just deciding to throw their brother in that pit and leave him for dead? They looked up and they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, he doesn't know Reuben's plan, of course, but Judah now speaks up, says to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. I also love that line. After all, he is our brother. Let's not kill him. Let's just sell him into slavery. <laughs> yes, you're right. He is our brother. <laughs> let's just do that. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and say, said, the boy isn't here, isn't there. Where can I turn now? 
Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it and see whether it's your son's robe. He recognized it and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has certainly been, poor, been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came and tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. What a lovely family. <laughs> and it gets even lovelier if you flip over the page and read Genesis 38 and everything that Judah and Tamar are involved in. And poor Joseph. First his brothers want to kill him and then they sell him into slavery. I mean, what hope does Joseph and the rest of his family have? in the midst of such dysfunction. I'll tell you the hope that they have. It's in Genesis chapter 39, verse two. As Joseph arrives as a slave now in Potiphar's house, we read this. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. And despite all the evil, all the unhealthy things that have happened, despite the fact that Joseph is now in a foreign land as a slave, God is still somehow present. God is still somehow working. In fact, there's a lot of evil, unhealthy things that you read about for all the families in the book of Genesis. I've mentioned already some of the baggage that Jacob and Leah and Rachel have, and then Judah and Tamar in the next chapter over. In fact, Judah is not, uh, God is not stopping to work in Judah's life either, even after all that, because you remember it's through Judah's line that Christ's family tree continues to go on, right? He will continue to work through even Judah. In throughout the entire book, though, of Genesis, we could go back even farther. We could go back to Jacob's parents, Isaac and Rebekah. They had their own issues, remember, with the deceitful way the mother helped Jacob get the birthright and blessing from his older brother Esau. Before that, Abraham had his own proxy wife debacle that resulted in two different nations. After the flood, we find Noah drunk and naked in his own tent. Even if you go back to the very first family, we find Cain killing his brother Abel. I mean, what is God thinking? That somehow our God is willing to stick around and work through these imperfect families, through all their feuds and friction. I think one of the central messages of the story of Joseph, maybe one of the central messages for the book of Genesis or for all of scripture is that despite our dysfunction, God does not give up on us. Amen. Isn't that good news? Amen. You know, as I was writing this sermon this week, I came to realize that I kind of have a problem with that phrase, dysfunctional family. I have a problem with that phrase, dysfunctional family, because it implies that there is a functional one <laughs> out there somewhere, right? <laughs> Now, now, we may not have the same baggage as Joseph's family, but we have all got something. Amen. What's that phrase? There's, there's several of them. Every family tree's got a few knots in it or has got some sap yeah. or you shake a family tree and some nuts fall out. You know? <laughs> They've come up with quite a few because people know it's true, right? None of our families are perfect. No church family is perfect. Our church family is not perfect. If you're a guest with us today, let me tell you that again. Our church family is not perfect. I'm not perfect. The rest of the pastors aren't perfect. None of you here are perfect. 
Sometimes, even without doing it on purpose, maybe we're like Joseph. I don't know if Joseph had, was purposely trying to c contribute to the dysfunction of his family, but I think even some of the honest things, maybe naive things he was doing, I don't know, maybe he did have a bad attitude. It's hard to tell. But maybe even with the best intentions, we can even still contribute to the dysfunction of a family. I can do that. One of the reasons I wanted us to have a sermon series on Joseph is so that we could be honest together as a community and a family of the reality that exists with dysfunction, to address it, to journey through it. Because every family deals with it. Every church deals with it. Because every family and every church is made up of imperfect people. But the good news is that God is still willing to make his presence available Amen. to imperfect people. Jesus. What a God. Yes, thank you, Jesus. He is even willing to work something for good from things that were intended to be evil, as we will learn as we journey more through Joseph's story. So the choice that we have is this. Are we going to lean in to God's presence or not amid the dysfunction. Amen. Amen. Joseph chooses to lean in to God's presence. He is a slave in a foreign land. His brothers have abused and betrayed him, but rather than give up, he clings to God. He chooses to rely on and trust in the spirit of the Lord, and it says he prospers. Hear me now, church. Even amid dysfunction, our lives can be positioned for purpose if we position our lives to be lived in the presence of God. Amen. In an issue of Christianity Today, I came across the, the story of well-known author and speaker Glenn Pearson. Maybe you have read some of his stuff. He shares the powerful story of his journey to faith despite the dysfunctional family that he grew up in. He writes, you're probably familiar with the popular arcade game called Whack-A-Mole, where mechanical moles randomly pop up and from their holes while you're trying to whack them with a mallet before they retreat. Well, he says, I grew up in what I would describe a reverse Whack-A-Mole world, feeling like the only mole in a family full of mallets. All the men in my family had significant issues, not the least of which was my father. When I was 12 years old, my dad just left our family. He withheld both financial and emotional support, and he rejected, mocked even, conventional displays of affection. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 9, Jesus asks, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Well, I have someone I can nominate. My dad's behavior would have been enough for my family, enough of a challenge for my family to deal with. But we also had two suicides in our family. My grandfather and my brother, close to, in time to each other, who battled manic depression and schizophrenia. My mother's side of the family had their challenges too. Don't have time to go through all of those. But her father also had different breakdowns in his life, spent time in and out of the hospital because of that. There wasn't a healthy man in my family anywhere that I could see. And religion played almost no role in my family, but deep down I knew that something was wrong in my life which led me to dabble in other unhealthy things like occult practices, astrology, and seances. But despite all the dysfunction, I discovered that God was still working. During my sophomore year of college, I stumbled into a campus Christian meeting and heard the gospel for the first time. As the presenter spoke, the Holy Spirit burned the realization of God's grace into my heart and that I needed to follow him and be part of this community. And the article goes on for quite a bit about, uh, as Pearson describes, his journey of faith following Jesus. He was somebody who was sometimes skeptical or had a lot of questions and, and how Jesus was patient with him and, and he's still patient with him and he's growing through all this. And it kind of culminates where he talks about how eventually God led him to do this ministry where he now mentors one-on-one -on -one other young men who have come from similar situations that he has come from. And he has this comment about that ministry. God opened the doors for him to do. He said, I just try to understand the circumstances of these young men that come to see me. Communicate I'm on their side and point them to practical insights rooted in scripture and be tempered by real, uh, that are tempered by real life experience. Essentially, I'm offering these men something I never had. 
It's just one way God continually uses what could have been a curse on my life to be a blessing to others. And then he concludes the article by saying this, years ago I visited a counselor hoping to piece together the complexities of my past. And after hearing parts of my story, the counselor commented, I've really got no explanation for why you are where you are. In my professional opinion, someone with your background should be uh, unemployable, divorced several times, abusive, an alcoholic, or some other kind of addict. But the fact that you are none of these things is a testimony to God's incredible grace. Family, if you are dealing with some kind of dysfunction, you are not alone. You are in good company. And I hope that Glenn Pearson's story or Joseph's story or, or the rest of the stories all throughout Scripture remind you that God has not given up on you or your family. Amen. His incredible grace is sufficient no matter what we are facing. His presence is still available. Somehow he is still able to work something for good. So my appeal to you today is don't give up family. God has not given up on you. Amen. Keep praying, keep trusting, keep positioning your life to be lived in the presence of God, and you will find hope even in the midst of dysfunction. Amen. I'm going to invite our praise team to come back up, and we're going to sing a song together. It's a new song. It was a new song for me. I'm sure it's going to be new for most of you, but it's a beautiful song talks about the opportunity that we have to position ourselves in the presence of God, to live in the presence of God. And so we want to meditate on how good God's presence is. We want, to, we want to have a prayer together as a church family that we want to get used to, that's what this song is called, used to this. We want to get used to living in God's presence, regardless of what we're facing.
presence. Thank you that it is still available for us despite all our dysfunction. We love you, Jesus. Amen.